A victory for free speech or for disinformation? That's the $44 billion question after Elon Musk's swoop for Twitter. Does it matter any more than Amazon's Jeff Bezos owning the Washington Post or all those French captains of industry who often, who's often money-losing media purchases buy them a platform to voice their views? Twitter is certainly a bullhorn, and the boss of Tesla and SpaceX certainly has opinions. A free speech absolutist? Musk lets loose in his tweets, for instance, once calling Canada's prime minister a Nazi over COVID restrictions. Who decides on what grounds whether, for instance, Donald Trump stays banned or gets restored to the platform? More broadly, is it up to Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, YouTube to regulate themselves? The European Union thinks not, but how far will leaders here go with plans to police content that incites hate and undermines democracy, this in the face of stiff opposition from across the Atlantic. Today in the France 24 debate, what Elon Musk wants, and with us uh, from Brisbane, Australia, uh, burning the midnight oil, is Jamie Susskind, his upcoming book, The Digital Republic on Freedom and Democracy in the 21st Century. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. He's not only a professor at Sciences Po, Fabrice Epelboin is the president of Your found the Your Foundation for Internet Resiliency. Welcome Absolutely. back to the show. Thanks for having me. Will Duffield, policy analyst at the Cato Institute's Center for Representative Government. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Great and, to be here. And we welcome from Miami, Nia Miyaragi, assistant professor at the University of Miami, senior fellow at the Brookings Institute Think Tank. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. The France 24 debate, where you can join the conversation, and you have on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24Debate. Let's start with the latest. We got Twitter's quarterly earnings. They beat market expectations when it comes to the number of daily users. Overall revenue, underwhelming. And the San Francisco-based company canceling a meeting with investors, preferring to keep, well, a low profile till the sale agreed three days ago is complete. Emerald Maxwell has more on that. Keen on making an entrance and dropping a bombshell, Elon Musk has once again pulled off a surprise. For $44 billion, the richest man in the world has bought his favorite social network, Twitter. Freely within the bounds of the law. The billionaire had long complained about what he sees as the platform's overly strict moderation policy and a lack of freedom for its 217 million daily users. Given that Twitter serves as the de facto public town square, Failing to adhere to free speech principles fundamentally undermines democracy. Named Time's Person of the Year in 2021, the businessman presents himself as a free speech absolutist. But his Twitter takeover has raised concerns among its users. Things will probably get worse on Twitter if he's trying to open up freedom of speech just because that allows room for fake news to spread, hate speech, stuff like that to happen, maybe um, harassment, more harassment. But what does the owner of Tesla electric cars, SpaceX rockets and Starlink internet satellites want with this not very profitable business? Some experts say the acquisition is political. He wants to extend his influence and get on the good side of important political players so that he can use these friendships to facilitate his entrepreneurial projects. The White House said that President Joe Biden was concerned about the power of large social media over people's everyday lives. His predecessor, meanwhile, who was banned by Twitter 18 months ago, says he won't be making a return to the platform, at least for now. Jamie Susskind, is this a good news story? I don't think it is, although it reflects a bigger story. The bigger story is this. It doesn't really matter whether it's Elon Musk or someone else who's decided to use their billions to buy Twitter. The point is that important forums of public debate are increasingly in the hands of very rich private individuals. And so the problem isn't Elon Musk himself. I don't know whether he'll be good for Twitter or not. The problem is the idea of Elon Musk, the idea that the rules of public debate are increasingly set by private corporations and those who own them. The alternative is a set of rules that are decided by the citizenry through the democratic process. It will never be perfect, but it's one which I think would be preferable to the idea that all we can do is sit back and debate like we are tonight and hope that Elon Musk will do the right thing with the immense power that he's just purchased. Fabrice Pelboin? I think 
he has a point here. Uh, it's a problem having public debate in the hands of private entrepreneurs. And it's been a problem for the past century, to be honest. There's nothing new here. The only new thing is that we are coming from a century where multi-millionaire bought newspaper, and we're entering a century where multi-billionaire buy social networks. There's nothing really new here. And um, the fact that Elon Musk is taking Twitter and promising transparency, full transparency on the code and the algorithm on the decision that will be made on censorship and that he will hand over to local legislation the ability to take into their own hands this censorship seems like a good idea. Now, we will see what will happen in real life, but still, so far, looks good. It looks good for you. So far, the promise made by Elon Musk, if he stands on his promises, looks good, really good. So, uh, Will Duffield, uh, you shouldn't leave those kinds of promises in the hands of private citizens, says Jamie Suskin. Do you agree with that? Well, I just don't think that's the way we do things in America. We do have public rules in the background. They are the First Amendment. And on top of that, civic society, individuals, institutions, etc., layer their own rules. Um, here, Musk would certainly like to liberalize Twitter, Twitter's rules, but I think he'll end up disappointing both his supporters and his critics to an extent because he will need to keep Twitter profitable in order to remain its new owner. And that will mean keeping advertisers happy or finding other sources of revenue. No. No. Niam Yaragi? I agree with your second guest. I do believe that, uh, at least in the United States, all major sources of media have always been privately owned. New York Times, Washington Post, Facebook, uh, all of these platforms have been owned by billionaires uh, for a very long time. And that despite being owned by billionaires, it does not mean that they can do whatever they want. Like any other company, they are still bound by the rules uh, of the of the country, specifically freedom of speech. And uh uh, and they have to abide by those rules. Are so. they bound by the rules? Because in a newspaper or in a broadcast medium like ours here, uh, we get sued into the Stone Age if uh, we incite to hatred or if we spread disinformation. I would say yes, because the rule that gives an exemption to Internet companies to uh, not be liable for what their uh, users say is, again, uh, Section 230 is the rule of the United States. Uh, so uh, if the public decides to change those rules, uh, then we have uh, mechanisms uh, in our country to change those rules. If we, for example, decided that Twitter should be responsible the same way that France 24 is responsible for what's been broadcasted on its platform, then we can change the rules. And once we do that, uh, we would see that uh, Twitter would change its behavior. But Jamie Suskin's point at the outset is we're putting a lot of ha trust here, and I'll put it to you, Neam, in the hands of, um, of one man. Uh, I think we are overestimating the influence that uh, Elon Musk would have because uh, Twitter was used to be owned by a bunch of other American billionaires, and it is still owned by American billionaires. So the only thing that has changed is that a different billionaire is now owning it. Um, and uh, and I do not see uh, the whole uh, concern about this new ownership. Jamie Suskin? I hope that's right. I don't think it is. I think there's obviously a difference now because what Elon Musk has done is essentially take the company into his own private ownership and it, on his own express terms, he's done so for political rather than commercial reasons. He wants to move the platform, rightly or wrongly, in a particular direction vis-a-vis -vis freedom of speech. Now, I agree with the other guests that any social media platform is going to be subject to the rules and regulations of the companies of the countries in which it operates. But that's trite. The question is, what should those rules and regulations be? And what I would respectfully ask my American friends is whether the First Amendment does indeed apply to private companies at all. And uh, it seems to me and a lot of the jurisprudence that the First Amendment doesn't place restrictions or, and certainly not duties on what social media platforms can do with the immense power at their disposal. So critics would say, well, in the United States, are you actually protecting free speech? Because someone like Elon Musk can make decisions with a great deal of flexibility without any intervention from the state. I think the situation is slightly different in Europe, and I think it's going to change even further. Will Duffield? 
Well, I think the state is just another singular unitary entity. So when we're, we're concerned about the power that, that Elon Musk has, you can go to many different platforms. You can start your own website. Um, if you're talking about finding a new state or set of regulations, that's a much harder change to make. Um, so I don't know why we would privilege uh, that, that sort of state governance over, um, over what Musk or you or I want to do with our websites. Well, what do you uh, – there are limits on free speech, even under the First Amendment. You can't cry fire in a crowded movie house, for instance, and you certainly can't spread disinformation. Uh, it's a topical subject. You know, we have war in Europe right now. Well, you know, I, I have to say, I really, I hate the fire in a crowded theater analogy. That goes back to a case that's no longer a good law in which the Supreme Court punished someone for handing out anti-draft literature. Um, so yes, there are legal limits um, if something, some speech poses an imminent threat. Uh, but again, most of what we see on social media, even the sort of hateful stuff, um, isn't imminently dangerous to anyone. You agree with that, Fabrice Epelbois? Not really. I, th I think we're missing a point. Uh, Elon Musk is taking Twitter away from Wall Street, which means he can lose. He can lose money. There's no problem. He has enough money. Twitter can lose money for decades, and uh, Elon Musk can can provide money for that. But he can also take Twitter off those algorithms that are designed to increase revenue, and those specific algorithms are those generating hate and hate speech and stuff like this and disinformation. So once Twitter is not anymore into the attention economy, many things can go much better on Twitter. And that's the point of taking Twitter off Wall Street. He doesn't need to make profit in order to satisfy Wall Street. He doesn't care anymore about Wall Street. He can lose money for years and decades before transforming Twitter into something else and something that could be profitable. And there are many possibilities in terms of technology, in terms of governance, in terms of decentralization of the governance, especially the governance when it comes to censorship. Many things are possible. And Twitter, without Wall Street, is going to have uh, many options that Facebook cannot take. So it really could be very interesting. All right, well, let's look at a, f a few points on this, if you if draw up a few graphs here. Uh, first of all, what does free speech mean to Elon Musk? Well, he tweeted about it uh, just uh, uh, a f just a, um, on Tuesday, and he said, by free speech, I simply mean that wh which matches the law. I'm against censorship that goes far beyond uh, the law. If people want less free speech, they will ask government to pass laws to that effect. Therefore, going beyond the law is contrary to the will of the people. Uh, let me put it to uh, let me put it to you, Jamie Suskin. Is that good enough for you? That's actually one of the uh, less objectionable things that Elon Musk has said about free speech. The, the slight difficulty with it, from my perspective, is that it's inconsistent with his previous utterances, where he said that he's a free speech absolutist. Well, you can't be a free speech absolutist if you want to operate Twitter in France or in Germany or in the United Kingdom, where the right to free speech is not absolute. And this is essentially my point. We're embarking on a sea of speculation here. Elon Musk is a brilliant and fascinating man, and it may well be that he will do things with Twitter that make it more attractive to its users. He may also do some things that make it less attractive, like making it a place where harassment can thrive. And it may not be, for instance, that an individual being harassed meets the standards of imminent threat that the other guests were referring to in a, mo a moment ago. But it might be this at the societal level, it's incredibly damaging to the fabric of democracy and to social cohesion. I'm just concerned that, brilliant though he is, a, a great deal of unaccountable power is being handed to this man, and his own public statements are inconsistent with each other. Well, There's many things, that, well, not a deep thinker when it comes to free speech. Well, Jamie, maybe it's Europe to the rescue if you're worried. Musk's purchase come days after the European Parliament and leaders of the EU27 agreed on a Digital Services Act. Its overriding principle is that what's illegal offline becomes illegal online. The Internal Markets Commissioner Thierry Breton himself uh, taking to Twitter. And here's uh, what he had to say. 
Um, he said that uh, be it cars or social media, any company operating in Europe needs to comply with our rules, regardless of their shareholding. Mr. Musk knows this well. He's familiar with European rules on automotive and will quickly adapt to the Digital Services Act. Jamie Suskind, are you reassured? Well, to a certain extent, yes. This is the this is this is the model that I would like to see. You have private companies, and if they want to operate in a particular jurisdiction, they're obliged to uh, obey the rules of that jurisdiction. In the European Union, it's been decided that the current rules as applying to online intermediaries need to be tightened up, that social media platforms are damaging democracy in ways that are serious and need to be fixed. And if Elon Musk is going to um, respect the legal uh, background and traditions of the countries in which he's operating, that's the model that I would like to see. What I am less comfortable with is one which essentially places no further regulation on social media platforms and lets them make their own decisions entirely. I'm not sure that's got us to a particularly good place. Uh, Will Duffield, uh, it's, um, uh, yes, a San Francisco-based company for now, Twitter, uh, but it plays in a global market, so it's going to have to respect these these rules. Are you reassured by what you're hearing from Brussels? Well, I, I think it's the, the latest in a series of salvos back and forth between the United States and Europe about whose speech norms will uh, govern on the Internet. Um, ultimately, I think that the, the profit motive will still constrain Musk and may ultimately present a greater check on his ambitions. Even than, if he uh, even if he takes the, this, he's going to take the company private, it'll be like so, the Orson Welles character in Citizen Kane. So, he doesn't care if the paper loses money. He, he has, but he's taken out a huge amount of debt in order to purchase Twitter. Twitter uh, itself is taking on about a billion a year in debt service, and so is Musk. And so in order to pay that debt, unless he's going to be personally shelling out two bill a year forever, um, the platform will still need to make money. Niam Yaragi, you agree? I do. And one thing that I think we are missing is the impact of economic incentives on how Twitter would operate, even if it's a private company. We're just assuming that if all these uh, gloomy predictions come true and Twitter becomes a beacon of fake news and misinformation and harassment of the users, the users continue to be there and the platform continues to be attractive for advertisers. It is not true. If, if Elon Musk uh, does not handle the business appropriately, if, uh, if your predictions come true, then we would see a platform that is no longer frequented by users and it would become irrelevant. We have a lot of other online platforms that are in fact uh, promoting fake news, promoting misinformation and users are not feeling safe there. And guess what? People are not going to use them. Uh, is that the case, for instance, for TikTok, where we saw during the French presidential election a lot of misinformation, uh, and we're seeing that a regulation so far is very light, and they're getting away with it? I think so. And the other important thing that we have to consider when you're talking about a regulation is to think about the uh, extent of uh, difficulty that it imposes on on the platforms, just to... Uh, give you an example, the amount of content that is published in 24 hours on Twitter is equivalent to the content that New York Times publishes in 182 years. So the sheer volume makes it very difficult to effectively moderate these uh, platforms. The other very important thing is the definition of hate speech and uh, and misinformation by itself. Uh, it, it implicitly assumes that there exists an authority with uh, the mm -hmm. highest moral and ethical grounds that has access to absolute cool. knowledge and therefore can, can determine what is hateful, what is the intent of the person behind the speech, and what is misinformation. I think COVID-19 was a very good example. In February 2020, if I said wearing masks would reduce transmission of COVID-19, uh, my speech would be categorized as misinformation, according to CDC and other authorities. Well, we soon realized that that was not misinformation. The same goes for hate speech. If I say, for example, I hate Trump, 
uh, should I be banned on Twitter and other social media? It all depends on to whom the speech is is hateful. And I think before setting these rules, we have to think very carefully whether we are willing to allow uh, uh, ourselves to design rules that would potentially be used by our opponents. What if Elon Musk comes and says, you know what, I really want to ban hate speech and misinformation on Twitter. And from now on, whoever hates me is going to be banned on Twitter. So Je and whoever shorts Tesla is going to be banned on Twitter. Do we want to have a platform like that? Yeah, well, that's that's exactly what uh, the New York Times was worried about in a piece uh, just a uh, a couple of days ago, uh, Elon Musk, who's got a long running uh, dispute uh, with uh, uh, who's got a long running dispute uh, with another billionaire, uh, Bill Gates, uh, David Leonard, uh, talking about that feud uh, in, in a piece uh, where he asked the question, uh, when uh, conspiracy theorists falsely posted that Gates was paying to develop COVID vaccines to implant chips in people, Twitter downranked the content and added fact check notices. If Musk were running Twitter then, would he have left those posts up to needle his nemesis, Jamie Susskind. We're getting closer to the heart of the issue here, and it's this. There's this false dichotomy between a world where no rules exist, no decisions are made about what is hateful, what is permissible, what is disinformation, and a regulated world where decisions are made. Uh, that's not the choice. Decisions are already being made every single day on social media platforms, which are by their very nature, the world's largest censorship organizations. Facebook has more members than Christianity. Twitter is the fourth most visited website on the internet. The decisions that are taken in these companies every day affect the speech environment in an inc incredibly profound way. And so there's no point sitting around and hoping for a world where no one makes decisions about these issues. People are already making decisions about them and not making decisions about them is a form of decision in itself. And so the only question is a political one. Where should ultimate authority lie when it comes to deciding the rules of social debate and public deliberation? I happen to think that private companies should have a margin of discretion, a considerable margin of discretion, but that it shouldn't be infinite and that the state should have a say too because it represents a broader interest than just the commercial pursuit of profit uh, or indeed the personal interests of the person who happens to own the company at the time. Fabrice Appelbois? Well, as a French citizen, I'm not really at ease with an American company regulating my free speech. I mean, we have laws. We just passed one in the European Union. And actually, this specific law we just passed on free speech regulate each and every European country in a very specific way. So free speech is not the same in France and in Germany or in Ireland. It's very different. Hate speech in Ireland wouldn't be considered as hate speech in France. So it's going to be very specific, and we're going to need some decentralization of some sort of authority, a mix between governmental authority and Twitter's private authority, to regulate local free speech. And it's going to be but very different. But you heard Nia Miraki saying that it's impossible because there's too much content. It is totally possible. It's impossible in today's economy. If you're on Wall Street, if you rely on uh, basically advertisement revenue to finance uh, moderation and censorship, it's not possible. There is no economic equation here. That's the problem for Twitter, for today's Twitter. That's the problem for Facebook. That's the problem for TikTok. Ad revenue isn't enough to have decent free speech regulation. But as of today, uh, Twitter is not going, well, tomorrow, Twitter won't be on Wall Street. It won't obey to the same uh, economics. Tomorrow, it might be something on the blockchain with a decentralized uh, a governance, with maybe a tokenomics, something totally, totally different out of this economy uh, based on the attention. And that's the major problem of hate speech. We are in a world where all social networks rely on advertisement, which is basically private uh, espionage in order to pay a little bit of uh, free speech regulation and pay some revenue for Wall Street. They cannot get off this equation as long as they're on Wall Street. Once they're not on Wall Street, they can explore different economic models. But and does that economic, because the economic model we know of that's not on Wall Street is more 
things like that are under the radar, like the dark web. And uh, ah, there's lots of legal stuff that are not on Wall Street. Lots of them. Uh, you could imagine, for example, paying for Twitter. Because you're a power user, you're going to pay a monthly fee, and this is going to be enough to regulate free speech. You can imagine tokenomics, which is a very broad set of topics. It's about the way economics work on the blockchain and on blockchain-based organization. You, you, there are tons of other models to explore. And I'm pretty sure Elon Musk has in mind the way uh, the blockchain is, uh, for example, decentralized, uh, decentralizing organization. That could be a, a something to explore for Twitter. And, and with those alternate ways of uh, those alternate business models, are you confident that uh, the, the precept we put forth by that European commissioner earlier, Thierry Breton, that uh, he'll play by the rules because he knows he has to? Uh, that's going to be a little more complex. But Twitter could basically open a bureau in France and say, OK, we have the ability to regulate French free speech. We need to have somebody from the government to talk with, which would be in France something called the ARCOM. Uh, which is a our broadcast authority. authority. It's, it's a broadcast authority that has... Like the, the Ofcom or the FCC in the United States. It's the roughly equivalent of the FCC, and they could work together with this French FCC in order to regulate French free speech. They could also cooperate m in a much better way with the French justice, because when there is harassment, we have law against harassment in France. The problem is Twitter never gives the IP addresses of the people harassing others. And that's a real problem here in France. It's causing some very dramatic issues. If Twitter was cooperating with the French justice, this wouldn't happen in France. So there's a, a major problem here that Twitter could totally regulate with opening its algorithm, getting out of Wall Street and cooperating with local authority, which seems like he's about to do, at least in his tweet. Jamie Suskind? Well, I don't disagree with a lot of that. And I mean, what, what I hope to see is a system in which Twitter and other social media platforms comply with the laws and the jurisdictions where they operate and where the laws in those jurisdictions are tailored to the views of free speech and public deliberation that exist in those countries. And by the way, that's what already happens. So the law and free speech is different in France and Germany, as has been said, than it is in the United States. And Twitter and Facebook accordingly moderate differently in those places. So, for instance, images which would be permissible in the United States, for example, of Nazi insignia, would not get past the Twitter filters in Germany or France where such images are banned. That will continue to be the case. So the real question here for me, as I said at the start, is not really Elon Musk or no Elon Musk, but what legal conditions is Elon Musk going to be operating in? What constraints are we going to place on him uh, and his whims? Because it does seem to me that something as important as Twitter, not just today, but in the future, the Twitters of today and the Twitters of tomorrow are things that shouldn't be left entirely to the judgment of those who happen to own them at a particular time. Uh, earlier, you were saying uh, how uh, both sides might be uh, disappointed. Let's listen to both sides. Inside of the Washington Beltway, uh, the purchase of Twitter raising hopes on the right and anxiety on the left. Let's listen. On Elon Musk, I would say, look, in many ways, Twitter has been a dark, dark place. I hope it doesn't get any darker. An incredible uh, event. Um, it'll be interesting to see uh, what, it, what impact it has on the way Twitter operates. But we're all watching it with a great deal of interest because... There's certainly been our share of complaints about the way it's been run in the past. Uh, Will Duffield, Will, uh, the, the Senate minority leader's uh, wishes come true, or is he going to be disappointed? Well, I, I think he will need to wait and see, and that may be good for the Internet writ large. Uh, there's been a lot of interest on the right in potentially changing or altering Section 230, but uh, Musk's Twitter will rely on it just as much as any other platform. And so, especially given the timing of this uh, transfer of Twitter around the midterms, um, it, it may uh, cool some heels when it comes to new Internet regulation. What do you think will happen in terms of, well, because it's a question a lot of people are asking here in France, the account of a certain Donald J. Trump. Well, you know, that's the sort of high-profile decision that I think uh, 
Musk may be called upon to sort of make himself. And he may allow Trump back on because it is likely to draw attention to Twitter and, and keep the platform profitable. It isn't a sort of difficult change in policy that would require a shift in how the rules are enforced, but instead allowing a single, albeit very important user, back on the platform. Um, whether he stays after that, I think, is, is another question. Uh, we're talking about uh, Twitter, Neam Yuragi, but uh, it is a medium that's uh, used by not that many people. We can uh, call up a, a graph that shows that uh, uh, right now, uh, when it, you talk about social media, it's uh, uh, Facebook that uh, rules. Uh, those who log on at least uh, once a month to uh, social media pick Facebook and Facebook owned Instagram. And while Twitter users only spend five hours a month on the platform, that number jumps to 19 hours a month for Facebook. And by the way, also for Twik TikTok, which uh, has uh, leapfrogged not only Twitter, but also also Snapchat. Uh, are we talking about Twitter too much because we use it as the chattering classes? I don't think so. Although the amount of time that users spend on Twitter itself is little, it does not mean that its overall influence in our society, economy, and politics is limited as well. Because look, right now, none of us is on Twitter, but we're talking about Twitter on your channel. Many of your viewers are not going to use Twitter, but they are going to learn about many developments that are announced on Twitter through other channels, such as uh, TV or newspaper. So the influence is there. And then the other thing that we have to take into account is the demographics of those users. For example, Facebook users may be more uh, older people, while uh, TikTok is, uh, is more younger pe uh, people, specifically teenagers. And these different demographics uh, are going to have different uh, uh, influence, again, on politics and on economy. So I do believe that Twitter has a lot of influence, despite the fact that if you merely look at the engagement hours and statistics, uh, other platforms may be ahead of it. Jamie Susskind, uh, speaking with uh, one person who, do, who does uh, issues of trying to fight disinformation, and they were saying the less uh, you're exposed to certified and verified news, the more you're susceptible to believing disinformation. Uh, the uh, the trend that you're seeing now with young people interested not in the same social media as older people, is that uh, a recipe for further undermining democracy? Again, I return to the likes of TikTok. Well, I'll say this. In the last five years or so, there's been a lot of studies into online disinformation, online polarization, and not all of the results are as intuitive as you'd think. This is really a very new field, and uh, it's useful when social media companies, by choice or by rule, give up data so that scholars can study it. It's not always obvious, for instance, why people become polarized on social media. For instance, it was thought for a long time that if you exposed people to views that were not their own, then they would become more moderate. But actually, it often seems to have the opposite effect. The more you see tweets from people whose political views you hate, the more entrenched you become in your views. So the engineering of these systems to try and uh, create a better speech environment, a better deliberative environment, is far from straightforward. And how about and when it comes it, to smelling disinformation? Well, uh, I, I don't really know if it is a matter of, of smelling it. I, I'll say this. The platforms have historically been pretty bad. It's getting better, but they've been pretty bad at engineering their systems in a way that reliable information is moved to the top. So, for instance... In the first few months of 2021, by far the most shared story on Facebook was a genuinely bogus article about the uh, adverse health effects of the coronavirus vaccine, proper quack science, and it was spread as much as anything else on that platform. Now, you don't need to be a kind of godlike platonic moderator to know that quack science should not be being promoted 
if it's going to cause major public health difficulties. And I would like to see platforms having requirements. I don't want to see governments getting involved in individual instances. So I wouldn't like to see, for instance, a regulator punishing Facebook for that particular story. But what a regulator can justifiably be interested in is whether Facebook has in place adequate systems for the reduction of risk of that kind of thing happening. We're, we're, we're moderating at an industrial scale here, millions, billions of posts a day. It's never going to be perfect. But the most we can hope for, and indeed I think require, is adequate systems for the reduction of risk, the risk being Money disinformation, polarization, whatever it is a country sets as its priorities. Fabrice Pelbois? We have many leaks from Facebook uh, showing that basically they can... Leaks? Grasp... You're calling them leaks? Yeah, leaks. Internal because leaks they don't from give the out their, their, their internal of data. Of course not. Uh, but we have uh, from Francis Hugan uh, many leaks from Facebook showing that basically they can handle up to this five... This was the whistleblower. The famous testified. Facebook whistleblower. And uh, they reveal that basically their algorithm is able to grasp 5% of this information. All the 95% that, uh, that are left are handled by human beings. So the, the equation is really simple. You need much more human being that you can pay with, with, with what Facebook is making. The economic equation on which Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, and the others are based is not able to handle the disinformation problem. The problem is in the business model itself. The problem is in Wall Street. The, you don't make enough money with Facebook user to pay enough moderator to regulate Facebook user. It's Act, a simple activists as that. say there is an antidote, which is if you push the certified information, then users by themselves Who will, will be certify? able. Who will certify? For example, let's take a very simple information published mm -hmm. by the New York Post just before Joe Biden's election, who was showing that Biden Hunter was doing some shady things, very shady business in president. Ukraine, and a quite horrific uh, private life. Those posts has been censored by Twitter under Twitter's authority, and they happen to be true. This was a major impact on the, uh, the American presidential election. And my guess is that the reason why left, the left side of the, uh, of the Senate is afraid of Twitter being handled to, do, to Elon Musk is that it could happen the opposite way in a very dark world, but we're already in this dark world. It's just a dark world favorable to Democrats. But we are in this dark world. What could be worse than that? Honestly, I, I, I'm not sure Twitter could ever be worse than that. What we witness, which is censorship of a critical information during a presidential election. Thanks God it didn't happen in my country. It happened in the United States. But I would be really mad at Twitter if it had happened in my country. Jamie Suskin? Do you know what? I actually don't disagree with that. I mean, sorry, I think, I think with respect, you may perhaps putting it a little high. I think things could be slightly worse. But um, I can understand why there is upset in America about the fact that that Hunter Biden story uh, in the New York Post was not allowed to run on Twitter shortly before the election. As it happens, I think, I think out of fairness, we should say that the reason it didn't run was because it breached Twitter's policy on, on using hacked materials rather than Wikileaks uh, because is on the Twitter. Truth or false Let's be bit. serious. But, 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 well, hold on. If I may finish my sentence, the points I make about Elon Musk apply equally to the way that Twitter is run just now. It seems to me that these are big and difficult decisions that platforms make. And the fact that they make them in the United States in an almost unregulated environment is problematic, regardless of whether you come for the left or from the left or the right. I think there's a lot of bad faith stuff on the right complaining about Twitter's moderation. I think there's also a lot of exaggeration on other sides of the political spectrum. It's best not to be too partisan about this. The truth is that platforms do a really difficult job, a really complex technical job that's also highly political in nature. And it's baffling to me that they're essentially left to do it uh, by themselves in certain countries without some degree of oversight. These are socially important functions. We should treat them as such. All right. Elon Musk's arrival uh, at Twitter, by the way, prompting a lecture on free speech from none other than the Kremlin. Поэтому посмотрим, что будет при новом владельце, что называется. 
Let's see what happens with the new owner, but at present this is a global company. We have already heard voices from Europe that they will not allow absolute freedom there. Therefore, the question in general is whether a full and free palette of different points of views is now possible in Western social networks. We have doubts regarding this. All right, uh, Will Duffield, when you're listening to the spokesperson for a government from a country that makes it illegal to call it an invasion, what's happening in Ukraine, what, what, what's your reaction when you listen to Dmitry Peskov? I, I mean, it's, it's just ridiculous. I don't know why anyone would listen to him. It's trolling and chaff. Um, yes, he comes from a ludicrously illiberal country where we all know you can't speak your mind. So... Um, I get, getting to what, what Jamie said, um, I, I think it's very important to recognize what expectations we're setting for social media platforms. The removal of the New York Post story didn't happen in a vacuum. It came after um, Twitter and other platforms were you know, berated and threatened with regulation for failing to remove enough Russian speech in the 2016 election. So they created new policies around hacked materials to try to mollify that um, that concern. And, you know, over the summer before the election, when it was applied to a police leak, nobody cared. But then in the context of this election, it became a big deal. Um, so I think we need to be more careful about what we expect platforms to do. And maybe need a little more uh, it, to take those big decisions out of the hands of single individuals and put them more in the hands of um, uh, regulatory bodies like we do in Europe? Well, the fact of the matter is the Constitution would not allow the U.S. government or one of its regulatory bodies to decide what is or is not fake news or disinformation and, and order companies to remove it. Um, that would, again, be a, a far greater single point of failure than allowing each platform to come up with its own rules. There is again, a regulatory Twitter, body in America. It's called the Federal Communications Commission. You're there are even words you're not allowed to say on television in the United States. You're not allowed to show nudity. Well, television is a much more regulated medium because the, the airwaves are limited. Spectrum is limited. And so, yes, the government has been given a broader ability to police that. We don't have that problem on the Internet. Anyone can create their own new website. So the justification for that sort of regulation just isn't there. Well, uh, so many celebrities, by the way, weighing in on this, including those who still don't quite believe that Elon Musk is serious with, again, a $44 billion purchase. Yeah, this is the tweet from uh, the rapper and actor Ice-T. It would be kind of dope if Musk bought Twitter and just shut it off. Laugh out loud. That's all the time we have for for now. Much more to talk about on this issue. Fascinating discussion. I want to thank Jamie Suskin for joining us from Brisbane. Uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Will Duffield uh, for being with us from Washington, from Miami, Niam Yaragi, Fabrice Pelboin. Thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate. <laughs>